up, Bloom Church? Man, y'all look good this morning. I'm so excited that you are here today. Real quick, could y'all help me welcome everyone watching online or Bloom Church Online campus? Come on. What's up? We are so excited that you are here today. We understand that you could be anywhere. So the fact that you are here today, it's not lost on us. And we are so honored to worship with you today. But before we go any further, we're, we're going to go there today in the, in the topic that we're, we're talking about. And I just feel it really, really heavy on my spirit that the enemy doesn't want us to learn about what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about identity. And this is one of the biggest areas that the enemy wants to attack because this is one of the biggest areas that he can have a foothold in our life. And we'll dig into that in a little bit, but can we just go before the Lord today and just ask him to remove anything that might get in the way from us receiving what he has for us today? So if you would, would you just hold out your hands in a posture to receive from him today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house and worship you. God, right now I pray against anything that might get in the way from us receiving the word that you have for us. God, may these be your words. God, make me a vessel. God, your words, not Tyler's words, God. Open our ears. Open our hearts. God, let there be no technical difficulties, God. Devil, you have no place here. Holy Spirit, fill this place like never before. We come expecting great and mighty things, Father. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name, we pray. And everybody at Bloom Church at 11 o'clock set, amen. amen. Come on. Y'all can celebrate if you want to. I mean, well, guys, if you are new here, we are right in the middle of a sermon series called Parenting with Purpose. And the whole premise of this, this series is understanding that we all leave a legacy, we all leave an inheritance, whether that's to our physical children, or maybe you've heard us say something about spiritual children. And to clarify, what that means is those who we mentor, those who we coach, those who we have any level of influence over. And this series is meant to get you thinking. It's meant to, to kind of to pick at your brain a little bit, to get you thinking about what kind of legacy are you leaving? What kind of inheritance are you passing down? Is it generational curses? Or is it generational blessings? And I know that that sounds really heavy, like right off the bat. But I would say good to that. Because we need to feel the weight. We need to feel the weight of the responsibility that we have been given as parents and our, our purpose as parents. Last week was absolutely incredible. Pastor Mike got real with us, right? His authenticity. And man, he just went there. Did you guys, did you guys get anything from that? Was that powerful? He asked a question, though, that I really want to dig into deeper. He talked about the power of words, but in one of his points, he asked, what's your true identity? Do you know who you truly are? And to take that one step further, do you know who you truly are as a child of God? You might say, well, I think so. But let me pose this question. Why is it important that we know so? Mark Driscoll said it so perfectly. He said, what you do flows from who you are. That's why it's important to know who we are because everything we do is gonna flow from who we are, the way we act, the way we parent, the way that we handle things, stresses, pressures, uh, the way we love, the way we receive love. Anything and everything we do is gonna flow from who we are. And so if, if we don't have a clear understanding of who we are, who we are as a, as a child of God, what our identity is, and we're just opening ourselves up for the enemy to come in and the, the world to say, well, this is who you need to be. Or the enemy to come in and attack our, our heavenly given identity and to have a foothold in, in who we are and who we were created to be. Again, what you do flows from who you are. I struggled with this personally for a long time. I looked 
to culture. I looked to this world to see what, what I needed to be. I thought I had to have this job. I thought I had to have this title, this car. I bought a house that was way too much for me to afford because I thought, well, I'm going to really get to impact some people's lives because they can, it's a bigger space for me to entertain. But I was so house poor that I couldn't afford for anybody to come into the house. I had to have all of these things because culture and the world told me that if you want to be successful, this is what you need. But when I gave my heart to Jesus and when I truly started living, surrendered for Jesus, I had to come to this understanding that we as believers, we live from our identity, not for our identity. Do you see that? Our identity has already been given to us. We don't have to do anything to to attain it or, or try and reach it. This understanding that we're defined by our relationship with Christ, not what we do or don't do for Christ. This is so important to really grasp because society says otherwise. Culture will tell you otherwise. And understanding this is so powerful for our foundation and our, and our faith. Because the reality is this, is once we know who we are, we'll know how to live. Once we're firmly planted, firmly grounded in our identity, we'll know exactly the steps to take, the path in which we should go and when we're firmly planted in our identity, when the enemy comes and tries to attack who we are, who God created us to be, we can stand firm. We cannot waver. And we can thrive through it all. Would you believe that this actually happened to Jesus? The devil actually tried to attack Jesus' identity. And he was able to stand firm in it. If you have your Bibles, you can take them out. We're going to be spending some time today in Luke chapter 4, and the story picks up like this. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time, and he became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, now pay attention here, if you are the Son of God, if you're really the Son of God, Well, you're so hungry, so you should tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, he said, no, the scriptures say people don't live by bread alone. Do you see what the devil's trying to do here? His first attempt to try and come at at Jesus' identity, he says, I'm going to belittle it. I'm going to try and get you to question it. If you're really the son of God, if you're really who you think you are, then you should turn, you should do this. But Jesus held strong. He said, no, because the scriptures say that people don't live by bread alone. The story goes on, and then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He said, I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them. Then the devil said, because they're mine to give anyone that I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. And Jesus replied, no. The scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Now, this is really important because as you see at that first attack of Jesus' identity, he tries to get him to question who he really is. If you're really the son of God, but look at this one. He takes him up to the highest point and he says, do you see all this? Do you see the things of this world? They're mine to give and I will give them all to you. If you just worship me. And can I tell you today that this is one of the most effective ways that the enemy tries to attack our identity today. Do you see the things of this world? And if you worship me, I'll give you all of them. You can have this success. You can have what, what the world says is right and true for you. If you just do this. This is what our kids hear every single day, multiple times a day. Culture says, hey, this is what you should do. And we look to this world and we think that it can give us what we need, what we were designed to to have. We think that that this world can tell us the places that we're supposed to go and, and what we're supposed to do. Our kids are seeing this. Our kids are hearing this. But the reality is there's only one person who can and has 
and will give us everything we need. And that's God, amen? amen? This is where our responsibility comes in as parents. This is where our responsibility comes in as, as people of influence over other people, both spiritual and physical children. Paul warns us about this in Romans. He says this, he says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. This is one of those things. If you do this, then watch where it goes. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. If you don't copy the customs of this world, then you will learn to know God's will for you. God's will for you, that's your identity, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I want to show you this. I want, I want you to think today about the relationships that you have in your life. I want you to think about the people that you come in contact with. I want you to think about the, the people that your, your kids come in contact with, whether that's in a school hallway, on a, on a baseball field, wherever that is. This little vase here, it represents us. It represents your kids. It represents you. But these ping pong balls, they represent those people. Like that kid that makes, made fun of your kid because he wore that shirt and that brand is so last year. Like that kid that makes fun and bullies your kid because them themselves are going through identity issues. Like that teacher who tells your kid, you learn different. You're kind of weird. I didn't get enough likes on my video, on my post. I didn't get enough comments. I didn't get enough reposts. You can't do that. You're not good enough to do that. You can't be in this. And then it follows us into adulthood. You need this job. You need this title. And you're 20. You should have a car. You should have a house. You're 25. You should be married. You should have kids. And what happens is if this is us, then we've let culture We've let this world, and we let people speak into our lives and tell us who we're supposed to be. Can I tell you today, this is why we need strong parental figures. This is why, this is what we're up against. This is our responsibility. This is why we have to pay close attention to the things that we're talking about this, because this is our purpose. This is our responsibility to help fix. And we're going we're gonna to come back to this, but I want you to listen to how the story continues. Then the devil took him, Jesus, to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and he said, if you're the son of God, there he goes again, if this is really who you are, then you should jump off. For the scriptures say that he, he's talking about God, God will order his angels to protect and guard you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. He says, if you're really the son of God, and then he takes it one step further, if God really loves you, then he won't want you to get hurt. So he'll make sure that the, the angels protect you and, 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 and you, won't even, you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Have you ever felt that? Has anyone ever said that to you? Well, if God really loves you, why this? If you're really a child of God, then why are you going through this? He tries to dig as deep as he can. Jesus replies like this. He says, because the scriptures also say that you, might, you must not test the Lord your God. And when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. He gone. He held so firm. He was so planted in his identity that any time that the devil came and tried to attack who he was, tried to go against his calling, tried to get him off the path, it didn't work. I'll give you the entire world. I'll, I, I, if you're really the son of God, but no, 
Why? Now, I do want to interject this. Notice that he says, until the next opportunity came. This is not a one-time thing. This is something that we will endure through our entire life and our, our children, they will endure through their entire life. The enemy wants to attack your identity because your identity needs to be planted in God and God has designed you for a bigger purpose. So that's, that puts a big target. But how? How do we get to that point? How do we get to the point where we are so planted and so firm in our identity that when the enemy does try and come at us, it's nothing. And we can we can be just like Jesus was and 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 just decline it and say no because I know who I am. Well, that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I promise you, if you take notes, please take notes and get some action behind them. Actually apply these things to your life, it can change the course of your life. If you take these things and start pouring these things into your children, both physical and spiritual, it can change the course of their life. The first thing that we need to do, if you're taking notes, write this down. The first thing that we need to do is know God. And now I know this one might sound super basic, right? Like, well, duh, Tyler. I probably guessed that I need to know the guy who's given me an identity. Could have guessed that. But stay with me for one second here. Because if we, if we look at the story of Jesus being tempted and the, the, the question that we have is, well, how did he get this? How did, he, how did he stand that firm in his identity? Then I want us to take a look at 2 Peter. It says this. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need. Everybody say everything we need. Everything. Come on, you all with me? Everybody say everything we need. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Now, that sounds pretty awesome, right? How do we get it? Well, I'm glad you asked because it doesn't leave us hanging, but it tells us, it says, we have received all this by coming to know him, the one who has called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Do you realize that God has already given us everything we need to live a godly life? God has already given us everything we need to live a life that's, that's against temptation, that's against culture, that, doesn't, that, that, that is firmly planted, that is our true identity. And all we have to do to, to get it is by coming to know him. Luke chapter 4, Jesus being tempted. I love this example. What's the one line that the devil kept asking him? Are you really the son of God? If you're really the son of God, then do this. But watch what happens in Luke chapter 3, just right before. Jesus is being baptized, and God the Father is actually there, and he tells him, he says, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Do you see that? Man, I can't help but think that God knew Jesus was about to walk into that situation. God knew that Jesus was about to walk into a situation where the devil was going to come at him and he was going to question his sonship. He was going to question his identity. And so God says, you know what? Before you walk into that, I'm going to give you everything you need. You are my beloved son. And with you, I am well pleased. I'm going to give you everything you need to stand firm in who I've called you to be and who I've created you to be. And can I tell you this morning that God wants to do the exact same for you and your life. You just have to get to know him. And what 2 Peter is really saying, summed up, is this, is that all you have to do to see God move unhealthy things in your life out is spend more time with him. If we look back at this vessel, which is supposed to represent our lives, and what do the ping pong balls represent? The people that have spoken things into our lives and tried to get us to to conform or or be something that we're not and if this water here is represents God what happens when we spend more time in the word what happens when we spend more time praying what happens when we actually enter into godly community what happens when we start building these healthy disciplines in our life is that we actually start to see the things of this world begin to move out of our lives and God begins to fill this up is anyone with me out there do you see 
that when you start building these healthy disciplines, the things of this world move out. Now, but here's the thing. We can't stop here. Because if we stop here, we're lukewarm. And the Bible warns us against lukewarm, right? Lukewarm says, well, I can do what I want. I can say what I want. I can act like I want. I can do this on the weekend. I can go here. I can drink that. I can smoke this. Because I still go to church. I still pray. I still still am in a life group. Can I tell you right now, speaking to the people in the back, if I were to ask someone who was distant from you what they saw from a distance, they might not even be able to see that there's water in here. They would just see the ping pong balls. The same is true with our inconsistencies. If we're not fully filled up with God, it's noticeable. If we're lukewarm, it's noticeable. But what happens when we continue to build those healthy disciplines, when we continue to fill ourselves up with God, is that we're just at a place where nothing, nothing can impact our true identity. We are fully filled up with God. And then this is my favorite part. What did that scripture say? It said that the enemy left him until the next opportunity, right? And so when the next time comes and the enemy tries to attack your identity... It can only stay on the surface. It doesn't matter how hard he tries to push it, how hard, how much he tries to make it stick, it can only stay on the surface. All we have to do to see God move unhealthy things in our life is spend more time with him. I want to encourage someone today. Get filled up with God. Get to know your God. If you don't have a healthy routine with healthy disciplines of prayer, going to church, get in a life group. Start serving at church. See what God does in and through your life when you start filling yourself up purely with him. And you let him overtake your identity. Watch what happens when you take your focus off of this world and the people of this world and the things of this world and you start focusing on your identity with God. Watch what he does for you. The second thing, after we know God, we need to know the truth. If I'm going to stand against the attacks of the enemy with my identity in Christ, then we've got to have a firm understanding of what he says about you. I'm going to ask you this question, and I want you to just answer it to yourself, but do you know what God thinks about you? Do your kids know what God thinks about them? Do the people you're mentoring, do the people you're coaching, do they know what God thinks about them? A.W. Tozer said this. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The truth that we believe when we, that, that, that comes into our heads when, when we think about what God thinks about us as the most important thing about us. It'll, it'll shape the way that we act. It'll shape the way that we react. It'll shape the way that we interact with people. And this right here will decipher whether we are, want to be planted in the things of this world or whether we want to be firmly rooted in the promises of God. So do you know what God thinks about you? I would even... I want you to go home and ask your kids. And I want you to pay close attention to the answers. Is it, yeah, I think so, and I I don't know why me. Yeah, but I'm not good enough. I don't deserve it. I've messed up too much, so that can't be for me. I've, I've done this, I've done that. Why would he love me that much? Or is it actually planted and rooted in the things, in the truth, that God says about you. Do you know that you're a child of God? I'm speaking to everybody in here. Do you know that you are a child of God? Listen to what it says in John. It says that, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. First Peter 2.9 says, but you are God's chosen treasure. Priests who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. You 
are God's chosen treasure. Then Ephesians goes on and says, for we are God's masterpiece. Do you know that? Each and every one of you in here, you are God's masterpiece. Someone needs to hear that today. You are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. That's identity. You are his masterpiece. He designed you. He created you anew in Christ so we can live out our identity that he planned for us long ago. Can I tell you that I could keep going verse after verse after verse after verse of what he thinks about you. He loves you. He's made you for more. I want you to stamp this on your heart. I want you to plant it deep, deep down in your spirit. And anything that goes against this, let me just say this is what we're called to do. 2 Corinthians says we demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. You're not good enough. No, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You're not strong enough. You're right, but through him I am. You can't do this. You can't, you can't take that step of faith. I'm his masterpiece. This is how we stand firm. Do you know that you have God's approval? Do you really know? Let me just encourage you. There is so much freedom that comes when you truly know that you have the approval of God. Because at that point, you don't need anyone else's. So the last thing that we can do to position ourselves in a posture to defeat the enemy's attack on our identities and our character is this, is that we can rely on him. We have to get to this place where we understand that we can't do this on our own. But nor were we created to do this on our own. And 2 Corinthians actually tells us that when we realize that it's not by our strength, it actually makes us stronger. Listen to what it says. Second Corinthians says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults and in the hardships and in the persecutions and in the troubles. Do you know what those sound like? Those sound like the things of this world that came. Now I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in all the things of this world and the troubles that come because when I suffer for Christ, for when I am weak, then I am made strong. When you can fully rely on God when you feel weak, when the insults come, when the hardships come, when those persecutions come, when the trials come, when the attacks of the enemy come at your identity, when he tries to say that the things of this world are greater than the identity and, the, and that the calling that God has given you, the manipulation to see the things of this world as greater, when this comes, you can stand firm. You can be planted in who you were called and created to be. Listen to what happened to Paul when he actually started living fully surrendered to God and actually started understanding this concept. He says, what actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to, to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a law man so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how, and it enabled me to do so. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It's no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion, and I'm no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you should see me living is not mine, but it's lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, and I'm not going back on that. You begin a new life when Jesus enters your heart. The old life is gone. It's crucified. The new life is here. The life that he called you to. The life that he created you to walk in. He loves you. He cares for you. He made you for more. My last question for you today is this, is are you currently walking in it? Are you currently walking in it? Are you currently filled up with God? Or are you letting the things of this world try and define who you are? Are you letting the things of this world, the people of this world, 
have an opportunity to speak into who you are and speak against what you were created to be. Maybe you have a relationship with Jesus, but you're feeling a little lukewarm. You've strayed away from the path a little bit, and now you're feeling that conviction to, you know what, I'm, I'm ready. I'm going all in. I tell you today that we don't ever want to end a service without giving you the opportunity to make this first step, and that's to fully surrender your heart to God. That's to receive the free gift of salvation. Pastor Mike says it all the time, that grace was never meant to be hard, it was just meant to be chosen. You might be in here right now, you might say, I've done too much. I've messed up. I just did this in the parking lot. Listen to me, I don't care what you did in the parking lot yesterday, last week, last month, last year. His mercies are new every morning. And you can make the decision right now. Let me just say this. You don't have to walk out of here carrying the same burden that you walked in with. And if you would like to make that decision today, if you would like to give your heart to Jesus and start fully surrendering your life to him, receive the salvation and start walking in the calling and the identity that he has created you to walk in, we're going to give you that opportunity here in just a second. We never want to end a service without giving you that opportunity to make that decision for your life. So all across this room, if you would, would you just bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? And I want you to put your hand over your heart as a symbol of your soul. And repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. And I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe your blood washes away all of my sins. Come be a part of my life. Today, I commit my life to you. I am chosen. I am loved. I am forgiven. I was made for more, and I matter. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you just flood the hearts and the minds of every single person in this room. I pray any shame, any condemnation, any lies from the enemy, God, leave in the name of Jesus. Your purpose, your, your identity begin to fill them up, God. Your love, your peace, your kindness, God. In Jesus' name. With every head still bowed and every eye still closed, if that was you today, again, if you said that prayer for the first time, or if you're rededicating your life to Jesus, in just a second, I'm going to ask you to do something really big and really bold. If that was you, in just a second, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. You might say, Tyler, why would you do that? For two reasons. One, the first reason, right now it's just me, you, and God, but I want that visual so that I can be praying for you in this new journey of yours. But the second reason, this is something to get really excited about. The second reason is this is your moment. This is, your, this is your mountain time here to tell that devil that he's got no hold on you. This is your time to tell that addiction that it, it's, it's not going to define where you're going. This is your time to tell that sin that you're done, tell those chains to break, and to tell your heavenly father that you are coming home. And so if that was you today, first time or rededicating, on the count of three, I want you to boldly raise your hand because we're going to celebrate. This is exciting. One, no looking around. Two, be courageous. And three, if that was you today, would you slip your hand up?